Well, good morning and welcome to the uh, the 29th and final week of virtual Bible class at the Southwest Church of Christ, at least for now. Uh, this uh, this week will will conclude the uh, the study of the great gospel of Luke, uh, which we began so many months ago. Uh, it uh, I did not really expect uh, to conclude it in a virtual environment. Uh, I kind of assumed that I would uh, get the opportunity to go back to uh, to uh, the congregation and and finish it in a in a Sunday morning classroom setting, but it didn't work out that way. So this will be presented uh, this morning uh, and then it's. Uh, in a virtual format once again, uh, and then beginning on this same week that this is actually going to be made available, uh, we will begin uh, a uh, a classroom setting uh, there at, at the congregation uh, at Southwest, uh, beginning a study of of Hebrews. So uh, let's begin our let's begin our thoughts uh, in this final virtual session uh, with prayer. Our Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to study your word. This pandemic that we have been uh, enduring, Father, for so many months uh, has, has prolonged. Uh, but we are rejoicing, Father, that we are to the point where we are hopefully being given the opportunity to, to get back together in a classroom setting uh, to continue our study of your, of your glorious word, Father. We're grateful for this wonderful study of Luke. We're grateful for this man, Luke, who took the opportunity and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit recorded the, the story and the life of our Savior. Uh, and it, is, it has been an inspiration to his Father. It has been uh, uh, a study that has hopefully brought us, each of us into a little bit closer relationship with our Savior and made us more like him. That is our that is our end goal. Our task in life is to become more and more like Jesus throughout our lives. Forgive us, always love us, we pray, and bless our study this morning as we begin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to pick up uh, in the 24th chapter, the final chapter of Luke, uh, in about the 13th verse. Over the last couple of chapters, uh, We've talked about this on several occasions. Luke, Luke was very abbreviated in his in his telling of the story of these last few uh, days and, and hours specifically of our Savior. Uh, he, all of the main points were covered, uh, but when we go to one of the other Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John, uh, we get in, in almost all cases uh, much more detail uh, and. Interestingly, now as we get to this uh, this stage where we are, you know, we are, we we've had we've had the we've had the the betrayal, we've had the the trials, we've now had the the scourging, we've had the the crucifixion, and we've had the resurrection, and now we're in those last times where uh, the Savior is uh, uh, appearing, uh, and as we know from Scripture, uh, he appeared for forty days. Uh, Luke's going to give us a snapshot of that also with again with the exception of this one event but uh, the 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 last few uh, the last few verses of the of, of Luke uh, will not be a disappointment uh, they, they tell an extraordinary story and give give an extraordinary experience of some men so let's pick up uh, in uh, in again Luke the 24th chapter 13th verse and behold Two of them, now that, that would likely be disciples, of course, two believers. Two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So we, 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 we kind of pick up at this point where we're, we're two men. This is kind of after the, after the, uh, the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, and they're walking to this town of, of, of Emmaus about seven miles away, and we're going to find them conversing about what's been going on. And they were talking with each other, verse 14, about all the things which had taken place. So, And what had taken place? I mean, uh, the Savior had been taken prisoner. He had been uh, tried six times. He had been crucified. He had uh, apparently arisen based on some stories that they're going to share with us. But specifically in the in the time that he was on the cross, some amazing things happened. Uh, dead rose from the grave. Uh the, the sun was obscured for three hours. Uh, the temple veil was, was was torn in half. There was an earthquake. This was a as, as a momentous of six hours as has probably ever been on in in the world. And and and, and then all of the other things that, that are happening. And they're they're just kind of walking along talking about this. 
and they were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Go, go. Mark gives that, you know, this particular story of these two men is only told in Luke, but Mark references it. Uh, let's go back over to his gospel. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 12. Uh, Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 12. We, we do get a, it's just a smidgen of insight from Mark about this. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 12. And, and listen to what Mark said. After that, he appeared in a different form. And, and isn't that interesting? He appeared in a different form, something that was not recognizable to them. And after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. So, Again, uh, in, in, in this particular case, Mark gives the, the small smidgen of information, uh, but it, it, it's, it's important because it helps us understand there was something about Jesus' appearance, his form, that was not recognizable. So let's go back to our, let's go back to our Luke passage. They were talking, and they were, and they were talking and discussing. Jesus himself approached and began traveling with him. But this is how Luke describes that. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So there was something again. And, and we don't know what it was. What was it? Was it the eyes that were prevented from him, or was it he, did he look different? Uh, we just don't really understand it. But there was something that, that didn't allow them to, to to recognize the Savior. And he said to them, "What are the words that you were exchanging about with each other as you were walking?" And they stood still, looking sad. You know, it, it's it's almost like this. And to them, someone walks up that they really don't recognize and says, "What you been, what are you what are y'all talking about here? What's this? What's this? What's this story?" And and they they kind of stopped and and you could see a look of of disdain on their face, a look of sadness, a, a look of of still a measure of shock as to what has actually transpired. One of them, in Cleopas, which is, again, these two particular men. This is the only time that this Cleopas is mentioned in the New Testament, and we're not given the name of the other man. And I think that's a little bit significant. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? I mean, this has been, again, one of the, the most unusual one or two days in the history of the world. And how could anyone who is in this in, in this in this area not have heard about what was going on? Uh, you can just you can just feel the perplexment in his in his voice. Uh, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of these things that have happened here in these days? And he, Jesus, and he said to him, "What things?" And they said, "The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers." delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But they were hoping that it would that it was he who was going to redeem them. I'm going to start rereading to verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since all these things happened. So there's a lot in that particular verse. That they're kind of reciting what has occurred. And, and, then, and then they kind of sum it up with, you know, we had great hope that this was going to be the one we've been waiting on, uh, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lamb of God, the, the, the chosen one who, who, would, who would redeem Israel. Uh, and in addition to that disappointment that they, they, they are feeling because they feel like it has not happened, they also say it's also the third day, which clearly these are believers who, who remember Jesus saying, I will die and I will rise again on the third day. And it's the third day. Nothing's happened. So you can feel a little sadness, frustration, uh, just, 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 just a, a general tone of, 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 of frustration that, that they've come to this, this very pivotal point and what they thought was going to happen didn't happen in their mind. So let's continue on. Verse 22. But also some women among some some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning, and did not find his body. They came saying they were, they had seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. Some of those who were with us just went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see. But him they did not see. So, and and the ones they're talking about there, 
uh, would of course be Peter and John, uh, the, the the two apostles that that raced to the to the to the open tomb and didn't find Jesus. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, what are these people doing? They're just they're just telling us this story. They're just telling what it is they're talking about, what's on their mind, what's what's happening in this in this world, which is of, of the highest importance. And so let's pick up in verse twenty five. And he, this is Jesus, and he said to them, Oh, foolish men, I, I think what he's trying to give is a measure of dramatic emphasis, uh, trying to just, just almost shock them into listening what he's got to say now. Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27, and this is a key verse here in understanding this. Then, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, we don't know how much Jesus told about the prophecies and how he fulfilled them. Uh, we know from studying in the Old Testament, there are 350 prophecies that, that talk about this coming Messiah, uh, this coming Lamb of God. And to a certain level, Jesus must have explained and then fully helped them understand uh, a good portion of that. As, as again, as they're walking along toward, toward the city of, of Emmaus. Uh, but that's that's kind of what happened. When then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going. That's Emmaus. So they've been they've been going where from, from Jerusalem over to Emmaus, about a seven mile journey, which is which is pretty good ways to walk when you're on foot. Uh, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he was going to go farther. So it's almost like Jesus has been walking to them. He's walking with them. He's been talking to them. He's been teaching them, and now they've reached their their destination. And he's just basically giving the impression that he's well. I'm gonna. I'm going to keep on going. Uh, so let's see their response. But they urged him saying, verse 29, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. Uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's an amazing testament to the awe that these men must have had of this, this series of, of prophecies and explanations that Jesus has been giving them. Uh, you know, they... They, they initially met this man and they thought, he, he knows nothing about what's going on. And, and, the, and the tables have kind of turned, as happened so many times with the Savior, the tables kind of turned and suddenly he's the teacher again. Uh, so let's continue on in, this, in, verse, in verse 30. We need to recline at the table. And, and so they've got their destination. They're going to sit down and eat now. When they had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. And... <laughs> We don't know. Was it his methodology as he as he as he broke the bread and he blessed the bread? Was that what triggered them? Was were their eyes opened in a miraculous fashion to recognize him? We really don't know. But but there's something about that particular event because they're going to talk about it again. Let's reread verse thirty. When he reclined at the table and with them and took the bread and blessed it and be, and begin and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. You know, here they've been walking and talking with this man for hours. Uh, they've gotten to where their destination. They've they've been together enough for a meal to be prepared. They're sitting down to break it, and then suddenly they recognize him. Uh, such a beautiful story. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him. And listen to this. This this is this is one of the the events that I think is is truly extraordinary in the life of Jesus, and, and it's really easy to, to just read over it, and he vanished from their side. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, we're going to learn a little bit later that Luke's going to give some hints that certainly it was his actual body that was was resurrected and, and life brought back to it because of something he's going to do. Uh, but as you're sitting there talking to someone, they literally just vanish away. Imagine the impact that this is now having. We've been talking with him for hours. We didn't recognize him. Suddenly we recognize him, and then he just vanishes. Uh, wow. So listen. To, let's see what their response is. Then they said to one another, were, our hearts, were, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So 
It's like, how could we not have recognized the Savior, the Messiah, the teacher? Uh, it, it, because it was, it, was like, it was like the way it was when he was with us before he died. Uh, and, and, and they're saying our hearts were burning. You could, you could just, you could just feel their, their, their excitement as, as they, as they, as they were being taught again, but they didn't really quite understand it just at that point. Verse 33, and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. So they spent several hours getting this, making this seven mile journey to Emmaus. They, they actually have an encounter with the Savior. Which, which they finally realized. And then after dinner, they turn around and they head back for Jerusalem. So uh, that's, uh, that's, a pretty good, that's a pretty good day's walk. Uh, it's going to be a total of about 14 miles. But they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the 11 and those who were with them. So clearly, these two men, Cleopas and, and one other man who was unnamed, uh, were, were a part of the group of disciples and followers. Uh, and so they knew where to find them. They went back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those that were gathered together and went back to them. So let's listen to what they say. And if, and if, if beginning of verse 34 saying, the Lord has really arisen and he appeared to Simon. Uh, so, and, and we, and we learn that over in first Corinthians, the, I guess the 15th chapter, verse five, Paul also shares with us that there was an appearance to Simon. Uh, Basically, they're coming into the room, and, and you, 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 can, you can feel the excitement as they, as they come into the room. It really happened. <laughs> he really arose. And, and I think this is the reason why, why, why two men who were almost not distinguished in Scripture in, in any other capacity were chosen for the longest story that Luke was given here. Proof not that this wasn't the inner circle. This wasn't this wasn't Jesus's closest friends. It wasn't it wasn't the apostles. It was just two believers. It was just two disciples, two followers, who had an encounter with the Savior and witnessed it and shared it with with others. And 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 because of their sharing it with these, Luke is now sharing it with these, us all these centuries later as proof. Jesus died. Jesus was in the earth. Three days and three nights, he lived again. He was resurrected. And, and, and these are the people that we look to for us and our faith as, as witnesses and were ones who experienced it and their story. And in all the little brevity that Luke has gone through to tell all these stories, the last few hours of Jesus' life, this is where he put his focus on a witness, not someone again who is, is a, who was greatly distinguished in Scripture, but just two men who who knew the Savior and who eventually recognized the Savior and were a witness. Uh, I think it's I think it's an extraordinary story and an extraordinary way that that Luke has has chosen to share that with us. Verse thirty five. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized to them in the breaking of the bread. And again, that, I mentioned that back earlier. Was it something that, that he, in the mannerism that he did as he broke the bread and blessed it and gave it to them? Or was it a miraculous opening of their eyes? I, I think, I think it's, it's not relevant. There was something that caused them to recognize the Savior. They did, and their reaction was extraordinary. And it's, 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 it's a great witness for us all these centuries later about people who were actually there. And it gives us faith. It gives us hope. So let's pick up uh, in verse 36. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. So in the same way that Jesus had vanished from these two men's uh, presence when they were having dinner earlier in the evening, now suddenly as they're telling the story, he reappears. Uh, we don't have a lot of clarity in scripture as to as to how that happened did he just walk into the room did did, did he did he just miraculously just appear I mean, that that would be the inference but we do, we don't really know but that's what the scripture says while they were telling him these things he himself jesus stood in their midst and said to them peace be to you and, and interesting that would be one of the last things he said to them uh, prior to his being taken prisoner uh, before the trials. But they were startled and frightened and thought 
they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And, and why do your doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is, that, that is, as I myself touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you, as you see that I have. Now this is an, this is an event that is recorded in some of the other, in, in a couple of the other gospels where, where Thomas was not present. And, and we all remember the story of Thomas, uh, how he had some doubt and he had to, he had to, to see for himself. Uh, and, 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 and I think uh, many times we, we kind of, we kind of fault Thomas for that. Uh, but uh, Thomas is just reacting the exact same way that the others did, where, where Jesus is saying, touch my hands, feel my flesh. It's me. I'm alive. I'm back. I, I, have, I have been resurrected and live again, just as I had promised. Uh, but that, that's where we're at here. Verse 40, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And you, and you, can, you can just in your mind's eye see, see these people come up and, and engage with the Savior and, and touch the Savior and, and, and realize that it's true. He has lived again. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they, while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? <laughs> and I, I, I love the way Luke ha, has placed that in, in this particular story because it, it helps us understand even more fully, this was a real man who had died, who had, who had gone through great misery, and he's hungry. <laughs> he, and, and eating is something that, 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 that people that are, that, that are alive do. And, you know, it, it's really easy to overlook it. But again, this is, this is given to us as proof, as, as a demonstration that Jesus was alive again. Have you anything to eat? They gave him, they gave him a, a, a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And I, the expectation there would likely be none of the rest of them ate. They just sit there transfixed on Jesus, and he's with them again. Uh, they, they, had, they had hoped, but they had, in many cases, in almost all cases, uh, they had lost hope, had lost faith. And... It's happening. It's right before him. He's he's sitting here with us, eating. Uh, just again, I, I just love the way Luke demonstrates in this particular manner. Verse forty-four. Now he said to them, "These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you." So he's basically saying, "This is something I said to you back before, uh, back before the cross, that all things which are written about me in the law and the prophets and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled." Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, he gives them at some level a gift of inspiration at this point. Uh, we, we all know that when, and, and we'll talk about this in far more detail when, when we get into the book of Acts in, in coming years. It, it'll, be a, it'll be a while before we get there. But one of the great gifts that Jesus brought and gives to them specifically in an extraordinary fashion was the was the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and and you you will again we'll go through it at that point, but we all remember the story. It set as as tongues of fire on their head, and it gave them the ability to understand, to to be able to to continue the the miracles that they'd done, and it was an extraordinary gift, and it was it was given to the twelve extraordinarily different than the gift of the Holy Spirit which we receive now as a comforter. Uh, so a topic that we will take up more in detail when, when it's appropriate. But, but that's the idea. But in here, in, at this point, he's giving them a, a gift of inspiration for them to understand. The scriptures are very clear. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, verse 46, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And, and what is that? That's, that's Jesus giving in, in a, in a one-sentence summary the plan of God. What was the plan of God? That I, he would send his son, he would teach, he would live a perfect life, he would be crucified, he would die, and he would rise again. That's, that, that's Jesus giving a, a summary of that. This it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. 
And, and why did he do that? He answers, his, he answers that in the next sentence. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And where are they? They are in Jerusalem. He is just sharing with them all of this preparation that we've been in, all of these teachings that I've been giving, all of these examples that I've been giving you, all that you have seen now begins anew. And it's, it's to help man receive forgiveness, salvation, hope. Uh, I, I, this, is just, this is just such an amazing piece of scripture. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name, Jesus' name, to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And, and listen to what he says. You are witnesses of these things. And that is so important. That's, that's, that's the essence of what we're getting here toward the end of, of chapter 24 of Luke about people who were there who saw. How can we have faith? We, we don't see. We, I've never seen Jesus. I've never seen any of the things that he'd done. But they did. They recorded it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And because of what they did, I have faith. I have hope. Uh, and, and that's exactly what the Savior is selling here in this story. You are witnesses of these things. In verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, that you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power on high. What is that? That's exactly what I talked about earlier. They're to stay until the day of Pentecost, when the Father will send the extraordinary gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell in them and to and, and to give them understanding, give them remembrance, to give them the ability to prove what they're doing, to prove what they're doing. How do they do that? By displaying the power which God is going to give them. Uh, just, just, just amazing. And 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 Jesus is 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 kind of summing it up here for them to help them understand. Now it really starts. Now Christianity really kicks in. Finally, we're going to get the thing that Jesus has been talking about from the very beginning of his ministry. The kingdom, the church. It's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. And, and he's, just, he's just helping them in kind of a final teaching here to understand all of you've learned is now coming to fruition. Uh, such a powerful inspirational piece of scripture. So let's, let's pick up in the last two or three verses of this great gospel of Luke, uh, verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Uh, now, we learned from one of the other gospels that, that this actually took place on, on a place called the Mount of Olives. Uh, the, and, and that Mount of Olives, kind of Bethany is butted right up against it. So that's, that's where they're at in this, right by this town of Bethany, uh, on the on the Mount of Olives, and Mount Olivet is also called. And he led them up as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed him. And listen to this: while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. You know, for a good long period of time, Jesus has yearned to be with the Father. He has he has seen his mission coming to an end. He has understood that the time was near and he yearned to go to the Father. And, and this, is, this is kind of a climactic period, a, a, a climactic statement for, for the Savior here. Uh, and he, he was blessing them. He parted with them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. You know, and, and, and a night that began with, well, three days of here and we still haven't got Jesus back ends with such a, a, a climax, a, a, such, a, such, a, such an, an, an event here. Verse 53, And we're continually in the temple, praising God, uh, worshiping, telling the story of Jesus, telling the, the plan of God, uh, telling people about the Messiah is, has been here and we now know why he came. It, it wasn't to it wasn't to defeat Romans. It wasn't to establish a new a new realm of of, of a kingdom that would, would reign on the earth. It was to bring forth a kingdom that would bring people salvation, bring people hope, bring people forgiveness, to bring people back to God. Sin separates us. Jesus reunites us through the cross, through His blood, through His sacrifice, His submission to God. Uh, 
Such an amazing story. I, I hope and pray that you have been blessed with this uh, with this great study of of the Gospel of Luke. It's it's gone on now for twenty nine weeks, which is which is a long time, and it's gone with me sitting here. Uh, talking into an iPhone, <laughs> which which isn't unusual, but it's been a tremendous study. It's been a, for me, it's been a great study, and I hope it has blessed your life and, and, and made you feel like you are, you, you, you understand the Savior better and you're closer to the Savior. Let's, let's close our, our entire study here with a prayer. Father, for this period of months that we've been together, we're thankful. You have given us an opportunity to study and understand your eternal wisdom, your eternal word, words that give us hope, words that give us an assurance that we can be reunited with our God. Something that sin separated can now be bridged and we can have redemption. Father, for this good man, Luke, who took the time to record these words and was so careful and attentive in his, in his efforts, we are grateful. But most of all, Father, we're grateful for Jesus, the, the one who is your son, who came and lived amongst us, lived as we live, suffered the same temptations, suffered the same disappointments and frustrations, yet was perfect. He lived a life that was sinless. And because of him, because of his love for us, because of his love for you and his submission to you, we can live forever with our God. Forgive us, our God, when we fall short. Bless us. May we stay true to this path that we call Christianity. May it be an old path that leads to a new place, heaven, with our God. Forgive us. Love us always. We ask these things in the name of your Son and our great Savior, Jesus. Amen.